I remember when I, was, uh, when I was a kid listening to that song, and it was so old. <laughs> and I remember, I don't know, I remember the Christmases of the past, and it just being a simpler time. How many of you remember it being a simpler time, the Christmases of the past? Some of you, and others of you are like, no, you didn't grow up in my household. It was crazy. Uh, I'm one of those. I love the crazy. I want to welcome you to our soft opening of our simple Christmas series. Uh, what do you think of the decorations? Just put that here so you can see it. There we go. Thank, I like the shirt. Thank you. You're, some people didn't, and they came up to me and said nice things like, that's an interesting shirt. <laughs> I like it. I like, I like it when people are honest. I, uh, I love Christmas. I really do. I love all of the craziness of Christmas. I love all the relatives coming in and the crazy like dynamics of having 25 people in a household. And I love the, the decorations and I love the Christmas music and I love the Christmas movies and I love the busyness when you go in Canadian Tire now and I just, I love that. I'm a weirdo. Um, uh, but I believe as we head into this year, uh, a time of year that can be some of the hardest and most stressful times of the year for many people, that we just need to simplify, to cut out the noise and the busyness and the issues and the glitz and glamour of it all. This year, for some reason, we are supposed to have a simple Christmas. And I realized as praying about it, why? It's because God is calling us into something very special in the future. And, and distraction can discourage us from destiny. I really do believe this, that distraction can discourage us from destiny, that each and every one of us has a destiny, both in our life and even over the Christmas season, that God has a, a purpose for you over this next Christmas season. And that if we let it, all of the distractions, all of the, the chaos, all of the busyness will distract us from actually fulfilling our destiny this Christmas. And as we head into the Christmas season, I really do believe uh, that it is so important for us to realize how much the people that we see, the people that we interact with um, as we shop and as we go to holiday parties and as we go to hockey games or as we have them into our homes, how much these people desperately need to know about the hope that is found in Jesus and how much he absolutely loves them and how much Jesus loves you and how it is that he loves you. And the problem is that if we don't simplify the extraneous, it'll never allow us to savor the extraordinary. That if we don't simplify all of those things that are just kind of okay, and they have all sorts of nice things about them, if we don't simplify those things, then we'll never get to a place where we're able to actually savor and revel in and be excited about the truly extraordinary truths around Christmas time. And there are some extraordinary things to ponder about this time of year. And we're going to start covering that next week. But here is the snafu in all of this. This is the time of year the message of Jesus could be heard the loudest, and yet the messengers of Jesus are the most distracted. I'm going to say that again. This is the time of year that the message of Jesus could be heard the loudest, but the messengers of Jesus can be the most distracted, which is why we are celebrating things just a little bit differently this year, different than we've ever done it before. This year we are having a simple Christmas where we get rid of the glitz and the glam and the sparkly decorations, well, except for one. You can stay, buddy. Um, and instead, we... Uh, we, we, just, we just focus on what it is that the season truly means. And, and we had a great plan even for the simple Christmas message series where we pared back all of the craziness that we normally do to just three simple things. Two, we're going to start with this huge tree, uh, a, a big 16-footer, 
uh, in, in the middle of the stage, and then we were going to talk about the lights, and then we are going to talk about the gift uh, that comes to us at Christmas, and, and why those tr- traditions, if we focus on their core beginnings, their meaning, uh, can be something with, with real substance this year. And then things began to unravel. And our great man-made plan started to be stripped away. And and although that left me feeling really super frustrated, I I find it funny how God sometimes uh, needs to get things into my head uh, where he just kind of like um, does things completely differently than I see in in order to work on my character. And it's great. And, and, And I get to realize things like, no, simple Christmas means uber simple Christmas. And I, I, I have to spend a day where I'm just a, a mean and nasty bear to my family all day yesterday uh, before I get it into my head that, no, God has a plan, and sometimes my plans of what it is that his plans are don't even begin to touch on what it is that he is interested in. And so um, God had a, a great day of working on my character yesterday. It was really, uh, really funny. Um, and I had to uh, uh, wake up my family in the middle of the night and apologize to them, so they're, they're okay with me now, uh, aren't you? Okay, thanks, baby. Um, and so I can talk a, a little bit about what it is that I should have realized. Um, what, I, what I should have realized in spending all my time off this week searching for the perfect Christmas tree to throw in the middle here, um, but just wasn't able to find the right one. Uh, and then spending all of uh, my time uh, working on, on this message that was all the really cool history behind the Christmas tree and how it is that that points us back to God. Um, and I should, have, I should have realized that it just wasn't coming together the way that I wanted to, and I was just felt like I was constantly banging up against something. I, I should have realized that why none of those things were actually clicking. It wasn't really like getting traction. It wasn't really like moving forward the way that I wanted it to, that I, I should have realized that because the only thing that really I got excited about was the unity that God was calling us to over this next season. I should have realized that when he meant simple Christmas, he meant really super simple We've been spending some time lately praying about what it is that the new year will look like for Connect as we continue to love people and spend time uh, finding new and exciting ways in order to reach people and better share the coolness of Jesus with other people, uh, that he was sent to this earth in order 2,000 years ago at Christmas time in order to show us love. Um, uh, and, and I was really kind of like thinking about what it is that this, this next season is going to bring for us and that we all needed to be unified as we headed into the Christmas uh, and, and New Year. And Colette, one of the directors at, at Connect Church here, uh, sent me a, a link to a message that really spoke to her yesterday. And I watched it. Um, it's by a, a guy named Andy Stanley. Uh, uh, and this message resonated so much with my heart. It once again just ignited a passion inside of me for the vision that we have always believed that we are called to as a church. And it confirmed the direction that we need to continue to move forward with if we are going to continue to be effective with what it is that God would like this church to be effective with. And Andy said it in such a way that just like made so much sense to me and where I've even in the past tried to communicate it and haven't communicated as clearly as I would have liked to have, that I felt like um, I, I would like us to watch a chunk of his movie, uh, of his, sorry, message, uh, video message this morning. And if you are new here today, I hope that as you listen to this uh, video message that you have it with an open heart about the type of church that we hope to be. And, and please, here's what I'd like you to do. If, if you look at this and, and this vision that he is casting uh, for what I believe this church is called to be as well, and you realize that we are not what it is that is being talked about up on the stage, if we are not... Uh, as relevant as we could be, if we are not as accepting as we could be, if we we are not as irresistible as we could be, please just come and point out the things that come to mind as you're watching this. And if you have been coming for a a while, I, I hope and pray that you have the same reaction that I have and I had when I listen to this message. I hope that, that God reminds you why it is that we do things the way that we do them and how important unity is and how much we need to focus on creating a place that people who aren't sure about God yet 
actually want to continue to come back and check, check it out. I hope that as a group of people that we move forward in the new year with a newfound purpose, a newfound unity in our vision and our mission, and that, that, that won't allow disunity and darkness into things where it shouldn't be. And I, and I hope that many... My prayer is that many people uh, get introduced to Jesus this Christmas season and in 2016 because the connectors in this room are working as a team to grow God's church. So here it is. We're going to watch Andy Stanley's message on the power of invitation. So what is the point of all that you say? The point is this, that at every major intersection in your life, um, there's been an invitation of sorts. In fact, you could actually tell your story through the lens and through the filter of invitations. In fact, don't think too much about this because this is kind of weird, but you are in this world because of an invitation. <laughs> somewhere and you're coming into this world, part of that story is somebody invited somebody to something somewhere, okay? <laughs> hopefully it was on a date and a whole bunch of dates and hopefully into a wedding, but there were invitations. Everybody got to this world through a series of invitations. And the flip side is this. Some of your, you know, some of the best things in your life were the result of an invitation. Some of your greatest regrets were the result of an invitation, right? You wish you hadn't called him back, called her back, texted her back, you wish you hadn't gone, you wish you had said no, right? So invitations are powerful, powerful things. Actually, invitations are, are life-changing things. In fact, an invitation, an invitation can change everything. In fact, again, as you think back through your life, an invitation can change everything. For all of us, at some point along the way, there was an invitation that we accepted or said no to, and looking back, it really was a pivotal point in our life. In, in many cases, it was a defining moment. Now, here's what I want to talk about for our remaining few minutes to, together today, because this is such a big deal. You, even though I don't know each of you, obviously, every single one of you, those of you at our campuses, at our churches who are watching online, every single one of you, you have the power, you have the power to change the trajectory of someone's entire life. You have the power to change the trajectory of someone's entire life through a single or through a series of invitations. You have the power, no matter what your education level is, no matter what your network of friends is, no matter what you have or don't have, you have the power to change the trajectory of someone's life through a single or through a series of invitations. And for me, I've actually dedicated my life to making it possible for you to change the trajectory of somebody's life through a single or through a series of invitations. And so have a whole lot of people at all of our churches. And let me tell you what I mean by that. 20 something years ago, 22, 23, um, 24 years ago, I was working for my dad at a great church, but it was a church like most churches that, are, that was designed by church people for church people, designed by church people for church people. So if you were a church people, it was the best church in town. The problem was when I would want to invite friends that weren't church people or had a bad experience in church or didn't know anything about church, when I would invite them to church, which was very rare, I would sit there and squirm the whole time because our church was so weird. Not for church people. It was a fabulous church for church people. But if you weren't a church people, our church was weird because churches create, you know, kind of a church culture. But the church that I worked in and grew up in and loved, it was my home church, the church that I grew up in and loved was designed, was perfectly designed for the results we were getting. We were the best church in town for people who wanted to go to church. But I was working with high school students and there was something in me that thought we can do better and it needs to be better. And we would create environments for high school kids and their parents would come and adults would stand in the back and I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking, why can't big church be like this? Why can't big, big church be a little bit more engaging, a little bit more fun, a little bit less church?
church for unchurched people, but a church environment, a church where people who were seekers or starters or returners, this is the language we use, somebody who was looking and asking questions, somebody who was ready to start their faith journey, or someone who had been bumped out of church or had a bad church experience and was returning, where seekers, starters, and returners could begin to connect with God in a real and authentic way and get their questions answered. Environments that we would begin to call irresistible, irresistible environments, where all the unnecessary stuff was removed. Um, appealing settings, where we created environments where, that were appealing and people felt comfortable in. Engaging communication. If somebody was gonna stand on a stage with a microphone, whether it was for children or high school kids or for adults, we wanted engaging communication and we wanted helpful content because we believed all these years that following Jesus, Following Jesus will make a person's life better regardless of what they believe about Jesus. And following Jesus will make you better at life. And we knew from what the New Testament taught that the men and women who followed Jesus eventually came to believe that he was the son of God, but they started following long before they came and recognized that reality, before they came to that conclusion or recognized that reality. We wanted to create environments where kids could not wait to be there on Sunday morning, even if it meant having to wake their parents up to get them there. And maybe most important of all, we wanted to create environments where the next generation of adults or high school students and middle school students and college students would stay so connected with their heavenly father and understand their faith in such a way that when they became adults, they would not wander from it, but they would be the next generation of church leaders and they would be more excited about Jesus and more excited about the church than the generation that had come along before them. And we didn't know if it would work, but that's what we wanted to do. And so we started our church. There was a passage of scripture that um, you know, has hung in my office for many years, and it, it comes out of Acts 15. And in Acts 15, I've told you this story before. In Acts 15, it was the first church business meeting. And the issue, there was, it was about 20 years after the resurrection, 20 years after the resurrection. And the problem was the um, Jewish leaders were arguing that, that Gentiles, that's most of us non-Jewish people, that Gentiles had to become Jews before they could become Christians because Jesus was Jewish. And they saw Jesus and his ministry as an extension of Judaism. Another group came along and said, no, Christianity is not an extension of Judaism. Judaism was like a cocoon that birthed and created the context, was the context and created the potential for Christianity. So there was this argument. And at the end of the day, the church leaders, about 20 years after the resurrection, concluded that men and women did not have to become Jewish first, that God had used the Jewish nation to birth this new thing that was not simply for a nation. It wasn't regional. It wasn't geographic. It was for the entire world. And in that meeting, Meeting, James, the brother of Jesus, stood up and made a statement that was really a, has been a guiding principle for us from the very beginning. Here's what James said. He said, it is my judgment, this is in the middle of a meeting, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, we should make it as easy as possible for people who are interested in, for people who are giving up their pagan ways, for people who are looking for answers. We should make it as easy as possible and anything that is unnecessarily difficult, we should remove. And so from the very beginning, we wanted to create churches that unchurched people loved to attend and that you could attend here as long as you wanted without changing anything you believed until you were ready, but that you would find yourself around people who were fantastic people and that the content would always be helpful. So for the first three and a half years, we met every other Sunday night in rented facilities. Um, we eventually bought a piece of property, borrowed some money, some people were generous. We built our very first building. In fact, if you're with me here at North Point today, this was our very first auditorium. I remember walking in here thinking, what have we done? This place is huge, what if nobody comes? But boy, did they come. Because we were the only church in our part of the city. In fact, we were one of the only churches in our part of the country. We weren't, were one of the few churches in the country that was designed not by church people for church people, what was designed by church people for people who were far from God or interested in God for seekers, starters, and returners. And hundreds of people came. And then thousands of people came. And then we built a second auditorium and, and people continued to come. And once a year back in those days, some of you remember this, I would actually get up once a year and I would preach my go away, we have too many people sermon. And it went kind of like this. We would say this, look, if you're a Christian 
and you're just here because you like the music. If you're a Christian and you just like our church better than your other church, if you're a Christian and you never plan to engage in our mission, which is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, if you don't plan to ever invest in a relationship and invite someone to church, if you're not on mission with us, we can't afford you. We didn't build this place for you. I don't wanna raise money and create empty seats for people who just want a better church or a better church experience. That's not what we're about. So either get in the game or get out of here, you know? And nobody would leave. They would just get in the game and invite more people. Then the idea for multi-site came along and we renovated a grocery store and spent unbelievable amounts of money to make that thing work in Buckhead. And thanks to that group of pioneers way back there, Buckhead Church exists today. Bought two and a half acres, built a four story building. It went on and on and on and on. And God has just given us so many opportunities and I'm surrounded by such great people. But we have grown primarily through invitations. People just like you who understood, I don't have to be a Bible scholar, I don't have to have all the answers, I don't need to be a marriage counselor, I don't have to be the best parent in the world, I don't have to be the best person in the world. But I can invite someone, I can say, come and see, come and see. I can't answer your questions, come and see. I know you, I don't know about all those things in the Old Testament, come and see. No, I, 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 I don't know about that either. Just come and see. And as people have been a part of what we're doing, God has just done that thing that happens when people who are seeker starters and returners, when people who are far from God but wanna be close to God, when people who have been beaten up by sin and are facing the consequences of sin, when they come and they are among people who are following Jesus, something special happens. And it's happened here over and over and over. And some of you get this, some of you get this because once upon a time, once upon a time you were unchurched. You're that person. In fact, you were here because somebody invited you. You can still remember the first time you pulled up in one of our parking lots. You can remember the first time somebody invited you and you said, no, no, no. And just like Gary Niebuhr kept inviting me to teach at that Bible study and kept inviting me to ask Sandra out, they were just relentless. And maybe two or three people invited you to one of our churches. And finally you said, okay, I'm gonna go one time so I can get these people to shut up already, you know? Or maybe it was your husband who said, honey, let's just try it. You know, maybe it was your kids. Hey, we wanna go to, you know, so-and-so's church, whatever it was. You understand. And it was too big and you don't like mega church and it's all those people and they're gonna expect you to raise your hand or fill something out. And you, you just weren't ready. You didn't wanna do that. You were nervous. You weren't sure your kids would, would like it. And then you got here and you began to acquire a taste for it. And you didn't believe everything we believed, but it was helpful and it was wholesome, and it was positive, and it's like, I think I'm gonna go back for more of that. You understand better than most of us the power of an invitation. Now, some of you don't understand this at all, and it's not your fault, you're like me, you grew up in church, and you moved to our, this area of town, and you were looking for a church, and you found us, and you like us, and we're so glad you found us, and we're so glad that you like us. Or somebody told you about our church, or something happened in your church, but you're church people, you're like me. And you were just looking for the best church you could find in your community. And honestly, I think we're the best church you can find in any community. But every pastor should feel that way about their church. And you're here, but here, here's... organization was more important, checking kids in was more important, you're thinking, man, I hope that whoever's preaching gets it right today. I hope we don't sing too long, and I hope we don't sing too short. I hope it's just right, and I hope they sing my favorite song, and I hope there's a baptism, but I hope it's a good baptism. I hope it's not some you know, person with some story nobody understands. All of a sudden, everything we do became so important to you, and for the very first time, you understand why we do what we do, and if you have never had that experience, as much as you may love what we do, it's not your fault. You don't fully get 
what we do. And it is extremely important that you get what we do. A few um, weeks ago, a couple of months ago now, Sandra and I had a couple over for dinner and Meg, the, uh, the woman that was married to the guy and the couple, she, she um, told us her story. She said, you know what? She said, I gotta tell you about inviting my mom and my sister um, to church. She said, my mom, they're from a different country. And she said, we, don't even, we hardly even know any Christians. When I say unchurched, I mean, it's not like we're against it. We just don't, nobody where I'm from even knows about it. We don't talk about it. It's just like something that exists for some people that we, I mean, it's just a non thing. So when they heard that Dave and I were real involved in a church, you know, that's just like a little bit freaky to them. She said, so my mom and my sister came, my mom came first, the next week my sister came, they were gonna stay with us a couple of weeks because it's so expensive, you know, travel halfway around the world. She said, so we brought my mom to church, and you're right, it's like, I'm, every, I'm looking at everything differently, like, is she gonna like this, is she gonna like that? We sit down, the music starts, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there singing, but I'm standing there singing, kind of watching her look around, and we sit down, and we start the collection, and my mom says, what's that? And she said, well, this is how we collect money, and she said, my mom got her purse out, and I said, no, mom, you don't need to give anything, and she said, are you kidding? I would pay for this. <laughs> now, we hadn't gotten to the sermon yet, okay? She said, I would pay for this. Now, let me tell you, you laugh, but I want you to think about something because we're all a bunch of church people, all right? Where else can you go to a facility like the one you're sitting in for free, sit shoulder to shoulder in a comfortable seat and have music and production like you have every single weekend and not buy a ticket? The answer is no place. So as an unchurched person, it's like, somebody had to pay for this, and this is worth something I'm more than happy to give. So then they go home. And, well, actually, they went, to, they went out to Connections, and her mom bought a bunch of the music. Then they go home, and then her sister comes into town. And she said, I sat there and listened to my unchurched mom talk to my unchurched sister about how great our church was. And she said, I, I kind of got it. I, I just, I saw it in a completely different way. Way And then the next weekend they came and brought her sister. Her sister loved it as well. I'm just telling you, until you've had that experience, you can't fully get it and it's not your fault. It's just the nature of what we do and the nature of the fact that so many of us are church people. So here's the thing. The key, and I, I don't have time to convince you of this, but I'm, this is absolutely true. The key for us, the key to us remaining a church that unchurched people love to attend, the key, the key to us remaining a church that unchurched people love to attend is you and your willingness to invite your unchurched friends and family and neighbors. And here's why. Because inviters critique and complain correctly. Inviters, they, inviters critique the right way and inviters complain about the right things. Church people critique incorrectly and they complain about all the wrong things. Now I'll just tell you a little bit behind the scenes stuff at Church World. Sometimes we get a lot of email, we get a lot of letters. And we read them, we go, church person, and throw it away, we don't care. We love, we care about them, but we're not, this is a church person. They are so used to having everything their way, which church person. Then we get certain complaints. And we're like, ah, this is somebody who's on mission with us. We're all about that. That's the filter. That's the filter. And the only way to keep us right on target and, and focused on what we need to do is for you to be an inviter because inviters critique the right way and they complain about the right things. See, if your thing is, well, we need to have this, you know, our churches have like the greatest preaching in the world and why don't we invite so-and-so and why don't we invite so-and-so and, you know, I listen to so-and-so and, you know, when are we gonna go through the book of Revelation? Never. You know, when are we gonna do all this stuff? It's because you're thinking like a church person, okay? People who are inviting people, they do not think that way. They want it to be short. They want it to be practical. They want the cookies on the bottom shelf. They want the low rung on the ladder. They want their guests to walk out and say, wow, that was helpful. Wow, I'm so glad I came. That's the win, not I never heard that before. I've been in church 25 years. I have never heard that before. That is not our goal. Our goal isn't to be unique. Our goal isn't to just say the same things over and over in different ways to keep you interested. Our goal is to create churches that unchurched people connect to, and the inviters get that. The other area where, we, where we under, you need to understand this is with our music. Because we love music, that's why we do nights of worship, because we love singing. But you know what? When you stand shoulder to shoulder with a 35-year-old or 45-year-old guy, and it's his first time, and he didn't know any of these songs, you're hoping for one and a half songs, one would be better. No matter how much you like music, because he's standing there like, okay, that lady has a question. Okay, is this like Q&A? Like, we're singing, and this lady has, that guy has two questions. What's up with these people? Now, you laugh. 
Because you're church people. Let me ask you something. Where else in culture do you go stand shoulder to shoulder with people and sing at a screen? I'll tell you. Concerts. But you bought a ticket and you already knew all the songs. For somebody to walk in here for free and stand shoulder to shoulder and for us to sing three or four or five songs, I'm telling you, it's just weird. Let me, let me tell you how weird it is, okay? There's a young lady who goes to Buckhead Church and I heard her tell her story the other day and it was phenomenal. And here's her story. She got invited, got invited, got invited. You know, she didn't, you know, it's, it's a wonderful story. So finally she decides, okay, I'm gonna go to Buckhead Church. Not gonna go by myself. So she invited a friend. He picks her up. They're on their way. They get there. Service starts and it's like, boom, you know, great music lights. And she says to him, it's a concert. It's like a concert. Then the words come up on the screen. He says, no, it's karaoke. <laughs> You've never thought one single time in your life karaoke when those words came up there because you're church people. I'm church people. <laughs> but where else do you go and stare at a screen and they put the words up there and you sing along? My friends, that's karaoke, okay? That's what that is. It's never dawned on you. Because in a minute, I mean, so quickly, we become insider and we become, if we're not careful, we become insider focused. Now, here's the thing. I don't want us to be the best churches in our communities. That's never been the goal. I don't want us to be the biggest churches. I want us to be the place that when you meet that person that's hit a roadblock, when you meet that person that's struggling, that couple that's struggling, they're, you know, they've got a prodigal child and they're not sure how to pray and they're not sure about prayer and they just ask you to think about them you know, in their difficult time. We wanna be that place where you think, you know what, you need to come to my church. Because they may not be talking about the subject you're wrestling with, but you need to be with the people at my church because I'm just telling you, just come and see. That's who we are. And the only way for us to stay there is for you to engage because I'm just telling you, okay? If you don't engage with us, and I'm not saying you haven't, but if you don't engage with us, you will complain about all the wrong things and you will critique us in all the wrong ways. And if we get enough complaints and critiques, we may start shifting in order to keep you happy. And then we'll just be a big version of the church that some of us grew up in. I was going to give you. You don't just say, sure. Say, you know, okay. So it's, it, we always, you know, we, we, we make it a bigger deal than it is. And for many people, they need to be invited about 10 times, okay? So, so we get that. But in addition to those sort of the, you know, the, the people that we would typically invite, I want you, especially this Christmas season, I want you to listen out for what we call the three little knots, okay? The three little knots are these. I'm not in church, you know, not in church, not going well, not prepared for. Not in church, well, we're not in church right now, or we just moved here, we're not in church, or we don't go to church, or you know, not going well, but boy, things at home aren't going well, things with my son aren't going well, things at work aren't going well. You know, my wife just, we just got a call from her doctor, things aren't going well, and not prepared for it. We just had our first child, just took on our new job, you know, we're empty nesters, or we just put our first grader in school, or just put our kid first kid in school, just not prepared for. Anytime you hear one of those, even with total strangers, you just say, really, really? Well, you should come to my church this Sunday. Really? You, well, well, you should come to church, my church this Sunday. Not church with me. These may be strangers. That may be appropriate, may not be. But even if it's not with you or meet you there, really, you should come to my church this Sunday. Let's just say this together. But when we, when we say really, we're gonna be like, really? Like, really, you're not in church? Really, it's not going well? Really? Okay, ready? Really? Well, you should come to church. 
this Sunday. Doesn't matter who's preaching, doesn't matter what the series is, you should just invite them. Now, about almost a year ago now, Sandra and I started doing this. We kind of make it a game. It's just anytime, anywhere, even overhearing other conversations, it's, it's really fun. You say, excuse me, I overheard what you said. You know what, you should come to my church this Sunday. Now, that used to be weird for me because I'm the preacher and I would kind of freak out about, you should come to my church this Sunday because I'm the speaker. And I thought, you know, Andy, that is so stupid because the, the, the beauty, if I can use the word magic, the beauty and the magic of what you do week in and week out really has very little to do with who's standing up here or what we're talking about. It's these fabulous environments that you create and pay for and volunteer in. It's these fabulous environments where kids come and they think, we can't wait to come back. So I decided I'm gonna quit being embarrassed about you know, inviting people because I'm the preacher. I mean, I would invite people, but I mean, we've gotten really bold. In fact, I think I told some of you the story where Sandra was checking out. She was down in Buckhead and she was t returning something and the girl in front of her was, was buying something and she was talking to the person running the desk, you know, with the, uh, the cash, we don't have cash registers anymore, the cash computer, what, what do we call it? The checkout station, checkout, yeah. She was checking out. Okay, anyway, <laughs> everybody's checking everybody out. So anyway, anyway, so the, the lady that was running the checkout center, we'll just call it the checkout center, um, um, was telling the, the, the lady that was buying something about her boyfriend. Things are going bad with her boyfriend. Maybe they knew each other. Sandra was listening. She said, you couldn't help it over here. But my boyfriend this, my boyfriend that. You know, so Sandra, you know, she said, I was probably 20 years older than this, this young lady. She said, when I got up there, I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't help but overhear you, but I just wanna say something. You need to break up with him. He is not good for you. And you need to come to my church Sunday at Buckhead Church. <laughs> It's like, break up, she added one. You know, you need to break up with him, okay? But you need to go to my church. And she said, Buckhead Church. Now, this is what's gonna happen because you guys have done such a great job. She said, Buckhead Church, I have some friends that go there. Then another guy says, oh yeah, I've been there before. Next thing you know, they're talking about Buckhead Church. She says, I'll do that. And I don't know whether she did or not. But you know, we just decided we're, if, if things aren't going well, something new going on in somebody's life, somebody's not at church, we're just gonna invite them. Now imagine what would happen in our communities if that happened. And we're not trying to get our church big. I mean, hello, we're big. In fact, we're the largest church in the country, according to one magazine. And it's like, no, and we, we don't even celebrate that because that's never been the goal. It's to create churches that unchurched people love to attend. And that's only gonna happen if we continue to be people who are concerned about people who are far from God. Now, let me ask you a question and I'm done. Do you know what hangs in the balance of your willingness to extend an invitation? And the answer is no. And do you know what hangs in the balance of your resistance to offering or extending an invitation? The answer is no. But here's what we do know. Every single defining moment in your life, for the most part, maybe every single defining moment in your life, there was an invitation involved. And you have no idea what hangs in the balance to just sort of insert yourself in a conversation or to finally invite that neighbor, or to finally get up the courage or ask for the fourth time. You have no idea what hangs in the balance. But if you are a part of one of our churches and somebody invited you, you're not mad at that person. You are grateful for that person. And there is somebody in your future who's going to be grateful for you because you took the time and you had the courage to invite. Because here's the thing, you, this is amazing. You have the power, you have the power to change the trajectory of someone's entire life and the life of their children and perhaps the life of their grandchildren simply by inviting or, by, or through a series of invitations. And by inviting, you have the power to ensure that we are always a group of churches that are designed with unchurched people in mind, that we continue to create services and environments with unchurched people in mind. As long as you're inviting, you're gonna critique us and you're gonna, complain, you're gonna critique us the right way and complain about the right things. But in the meantime, you have no idea what or who hangs in the balance of your willingness and your courage to invite, because here's what we know. An invitation can change everything. How many, how many of you absolutely know that to be the case? See, I, I do. Uh, I, I know when somebody for the first time, Jody and I just came into the church, and somebody for the first time on the very first day invited me out for lunch afterwards. And it really wasn't even the church service that sold it for us. It was the fact that people cared and people were willing to invite. 
and get out of their own insecurities and get out of their own issues enough to look to somebody else. And I am eternally grateful (laughs) to those people who just decided to invite. And uh, we want to help you do that as well. Like I said, today was our soft launch of our Christmas series. Next week is our real launch. In your handout today, you got one of these. This is to help you with the invitation. Sometimes we find it sometimes nice to just hand somebody something that has a little bit of information on it. If you only got one of them and you would like more of them, you can get them at the Ask Me booth. Um, I, I really do believe that, that what it is that he said at the end there, that an invitation can change everything, that God has some of you in the building here this morning in order for you to hear this so that you can go out this week with that empowerment of realizing that God will use you to change everything for somebody else. And all you have to do is just say, come to my church this Sunday. So pray about who it is that that is. Pray about who those people maybe are supposed to be. And and the good news is, statistics tell us that around Christmas time, 80% of people will say yes if you invite them to church. 80% at Christmas time. Let's just pray. Father God, I thank you for the challenge that you gave us this morning. I thank you that uh, you want us to step out and and begin to rediscover how it is that unchurched people or, or, or restarters are beginning to see how it is that they would see church. Lord, help us critique the right way. Help us always come into church uh, seeing it through the eyes of those people so that we can better understand how to be more relevant to them, more irresistible to them, more engaging with them, and more loving towards them. So Father, just help us do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out this morning. Please be an inviter. This week, invite somebody out. To, we, got, uh, we got some special things planned next week. We got some awesome Christmas tunes coming up next week. We got a, a, a I'm hoping what's going to be the, the best message I've ever given in my entire life uh, <laughs> next week. Um, so I- invite somebody out to it. Um, if you are a partner at this church, if you are somebody who is like, I am absolutely committed to this church and I know that I am committed to this church, then we are, as you know, as you got in your email, uh, a quick, uh, we're having a quick 10 minute meeting in 10 minutes. Uh, I shouldn't say 10 minutes. I'm hoping it's going to be a 10 minute meeting. It depends how much it is that you guys have to say. Um, but we, as a result of your guys's prayer, man, you guys, I can't tell you how cool that is to watch a building that has sat empty for eight months without anybody going through it as a result of this group of people praying, having three separate buyers uh, come through it. And we now have uh, an offer that we need to pray about and talk about here today. So go get your kids. Go relieve the folks who are at children's ministry very quickly. Go do that. And then come on back in here and sit in the first uh, five or six rows.